Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Not everyone likes receiving mail, at least not when it has things like pre-approved or final notice printed on the front of the envelope. But receiving a handwritten letter or a postcard in an age of email and text messages, few things feel that special. Unless you lived in Colford in Gloucestershire, England, during the Christmas of 1923, while the residents were opening holiday cards from loved ones, there was something else tucked into their mailboxes. Postcards. But these weren't quickly dashed off scribblings from friends in exotic locations. They had come from one anonymous source, a person living right under their noses. On these postcards, the sender had written offensive messages. Some even included obscene images. According to an article in the Daily British Whig printed at the time, these postcards were described as, and I quote, full of the most horrible, vulgar coarseness. They'd been arriving since July of that year and were so grotesque in nature, no paper would print what was actually written on any of them. So, how was the culprit found if the postcards had been sent anonymously? Well, the halfpenny stamps that were used to mail them had been marked by a post office official in invisible ink. They were then handed to another employee with the instruction to only sell them to one person, a middle-aged unmarried woman from Colford named Diana Langham. Was it her marital status that had tipped off the authorities, or perhaps her behavior toward her neighbors? We're not sure, but on December 3rd, Miss Langham purchased 12 of the marked stamps, followed by four more a few days later. The trap was set. Around the 10th of December, a bank cashier named Charles Saunders received a postcard in the mail bearing a halfpenny stamp. The message was laden with vulgarities, and the card was given to the police for analysis. Lo and behold, the postage bore the secret invisible mark. It was enough to have a Detective Sergeant Giles from Scotland Yard follow Miss Langham around town. He tailed her throughout Colford, observing her movements. And after some time, he finally saw what he'd been looking for. It was poking out of her pocket. A postcard. On December 13th, Langham traveled to the local marketplace, presumably to do some holiday shopping, when the police closed in on her. She was taken into custody in front of many of her friends and neighbors, no doubt sending them into a frenzy of whispers and gossip. One witness heard Langham tell the police, I know nothing about the postcards. She may not have, but her victims sure did. Charles Saunders had received 32 of them, and almost all of them had been sent directly to the bank where he worked. Two postcards had been addressed to his wife, while another man, Stanley Roberts, got four obscene postcards, as well as one letter. Langham was charged with sending indecent postal communications and was brought to the Colford Police Court the next day. Predictably, she pled not guilty to the charges. She said as much to the sergeant the day before. It seems that no matter how much evidence they had, Miss Langham refused to confess to her crimes. The police even conducted a search of her home and found more postcards like the one sent to Mr. Saunders and his wife. There was also blotting paper bearing some of the words that had appeared on the other finished products. And with that, Miss Langham was remanded into custody and taken off to Cardiff Prison, a holding facility for women some distance away. On December 21st, she stood before a special court held back in Colford. If she was found guilty by the magistrates, she would be ordered to pay a fine of 10 pounds. But if she was ordered to stand trial, she faced up to a year in prison. What nobody could figure out, though, including Langham's own lawyer, was why? Why had she sent these vile missives at all? Well, it should come as no shock that her actions were blamed by the men of the court on a strange mental and nervous condition, the AKA menopause. She eventually changed her plea to guilty and apologized for her actions, swearing never to repeat them in the future. And by swearing, I mean promising, not actually swearing. The judge, appreciative of her change of heart and for not putting everyone through the hassle of a trial, only sentenced her to six months incarceration. After her release, Miss Langa moved in with her sister and brother-in-law in Somerset. She lived to be 82, finally passing away in the mid-1950s. And although she had left behind a will detailing how her assets were to be divided, she never told anyone 
what they really wanted to know. In total, Diane Langham had sent 42 communications. 32 of them had gone to Mr. Saunders. And nobody ever found out why. If you ever go shopping looking for a particular item, you might find yourself facing cheap imitations instead. From designer handbags to consumer electronics, it's easy to fall for a seller scam. What we want is the actual product, the genuine article. One man knew the value of the product that he made, and because of his engineering talent, so did everyone else. Born in 1844 in Ontario, it seemed Elijah was destined to work on the railroad. His parents, George and Mildred, had fled Kentucky on the Underground Railroad in the mid-1830s. They landed across the border in Canada, where they gave birth to Elijah, along with 10 of his 11 siblings. He grew up during a time when schools in Upper Canada were still segregated. He received his education from black schools in Colchester Township. Then, when he was 15, Elijah traveled to Scotland. He attended the University of Edinburgh, where he studied to become a mechanical engineer. Eventually, he returned to his family in 1866, but they were no longer in Ontario. George, Mildred, and his siblings had left Canada for Michigan several years prior, where they could remain free. By now, the Civil War had ended and slavery was abolished, but Elijah still faced an uphill battle. No one would hire him as an engineer because he was black, so he decided to put his dreams on the back burner in favor of gainful employment with the Michigan Central Railroad. They hired him as a fireman and oiler. His job was to keep parts of the train well-oiled so that it could function efficiently. When the train was stopped, Elijah would apply oil to the axles and bearings. Then he would shovel coal to keep the fire burning hot for the next leg of the journey. But the job was strenuous and wasteful. After all, he used a lot of oil and energy to keep the trains lubricated. He believed that a better method was possible, one that would allow the train to be oiled while still in motion, reducing the need for extra stops and starts on each trip. And so, Elijah put his engineering mind to work. He developed a device called an automatic lubricator, designed to be used on steam locomotives and ships. The automatic lubricator used gravity to supply oil to the necessary parts from a central cup or reservoir. It was also called the lubricating cup, or lubricating oil cup, and he had it patented in 1872. It became a hit with engineers and railroad companies all over. Now they could keep the trains running for longer periods of time. Several years later, in 1882, Elijah moved to Detroit, Michigan. He began consulting with various engineering firms, sharing his knowledge and expertise. He continued to improve the automatic lubricator and file additional patents through his life. But that one device wasn't his only contribution to the world. Elijah also invented a portable ironing board to help his wife when pressing clothes, and he came up with an automatic lawn sprinkler to make watering his lawn easier. He eventually started his own manufacturing company in 1920. But there was one more thing Elijah was responsible for, and it happened by accident. After his automatic lubricator hit the market, other cheaper versions soon followed. Railroad engineers had been burned by wasting their money on poorly made knockoffs, and so they started asking for Elijah's product by name. More specifically, by his last name, McCoy. They wanted, as they called it, the real McCoy system. Which is why today, when someone says that something is the real McCoy, they're saying it's a genuine item and not some cheap knockoff. Elijah McCoy had grown up the child of enslaved people to become one of the most successful and influential businessmen of the 19th century. In fact, in 2011, Michigan Senator Debbie Stabenow authored an amendment to the Patent Reform Act of 2011 in support of Elijah. The amendment designated the first satellite office of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in his name. The Elijah J. McCoy United States Patent and Trademark Office facility opened in July of 2012. There's no other office like it. It is, as you know, the real McCoy. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. 
And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.